Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second virtual IOSH Railway Group Conference with the title Back on Track Following COVID. For today's webinar, I would like to welcome and introduce Nick Millington, Director of the Safety Task Force in Network Rail. Nick has spent 30 years on the railways and some of that time in various frontline roles. He is also a chartered civil engineer, a chartered project manager, and a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers. And he frequently spends his time mentoring engineers. With his wealth of railway experience and his passion for making a difference to track worker safety, he has taken on the lead role for the Safety Task Force, reducing near misses on our infrastructure. Nick has kindly returned today to talk to us about what has happened since Margam. In 2019, Gareth and Spike were killed undertaking maintenance work in Margam, South Wales. And a year on from having Nick with us, he is here again to update us on what has changed. So with that introduction, I would like to hand over to Nick with his presentation. Thanks, Caroline, and thank you to everyone who's watching. I'll just share my screen a second before we get going. Um, thank you, Caroline. Thank you to everyone for your time and allowing me the space to, to give you an update. Just picking up on what Caroline said there, it doesn't feel like um, I had time off for COVID, if I'm honest with you. The Safety Task Force, when COVID started in March, we were in the thick of it, big style, in terms of um, the work that we were doing to improve track worker safety. And other than the, um, the necessities of following the government restrictions, we have had a relentless programme of activity that has gone right the way through. And um, we've achieved quite a bit. We've still got a lot more to do. But the, um, I, was, I'm, I am pleasantly pleased with where we find ourselves um, and, we, and also that COVID really hasn't impacted or impeded our progress. So in that respect, um, it doesn't feel like I'm back on track after COVID. It feels like I'm living with it. And I guess that's the same for everybody else. So I'm Nick, I lead the Network Rail Safety Task Force. And I've got about maybe half an hour before um, I hand over for questions. Um, and I'll just update you on where we are with regard to the safety task force. So Gareth and Spike, as Caroline mentioned, two maintenance workers working at the Port Talbot permanent way section were struck and killed in July of 2019. I actually went to Port Talbot last week. I did a night shift with the team, just checking with them. I spend quite a lot of time out and about on site. And if any of you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see my blogs and various updates that I post there. And by all means, um, link in and you'll get more updates um, with more detail than today. So before Gareth and Spike were killed, the ORR were getting increasingly, I guess, um, concerned about the way that we put track workers to work on our railway. Our railway has got busier, trains have become more frequent. This is obviously prior to COVID and they're faster and they're quieter. And some of the surveillance fed back is that we were not able as a, as a kind of infrastructure manager to, to, to demonstrate how we followed the hierarchy of operational risk controls in order to put people to work. And I saw the drafts of those, the notices before they were served. We now have two safety improvement notices that were served in 2019. And if I'm honest, I think it was a fair cop. Um, I used to manage the, the Western maintenance team, 1500 people, 2000 miles of railway. And when I arrived there, I was surprised at the lack of rigor in planning and preventative measures. And I put about uh, a number of measures in Weston before um, the events where Gareth and Spike were killed to, to, to reduce the risk to track workers. And it's probably that work that I was doing that uh, ended up with me doing it on a national basis. And that's where I am now. And that's where I've been for nearly two years, or just over two years, in fact. So we've got two safety improvement notices We've got a number of Ray, rail accident investigation branch reports suggesting you know, recommendations to, to improve the, um, the safety to our track workers. Near misses were, were we, we're having about one and a half near misses per week, about 70 odd per year. 
they were stubborn in terms of their frequency, they weren't coming down and we had to act. And that's where I came in, in August 2019 to, to lead or set up and lead a safety task force team that puts rigor into planning, deploys safety equipment where it's needed and um, deals with a number of other um, issues with regard to the planning systems, um, the way that we plan and negotiate access, the way that we schedule tasks, the way that we carry out some of the tasks as well, so that we could reduce the risk to our track workers. So it's been a busy old program. Um, and if I just move on. So at the top of this slide, this, this slide when I started had two people on it, it's now got four. Okay, and it kind of reminds all of us of the ever present danger from fast moving trains. So Gareth and Spike, like I've mentioned, were sadly struck and killed at Margham. In April of 2020, Gareth, um, sorry, Aidan was sadly struck and killed at, um, at Road in Northamptonshire. Now, um, slightly different event. Um, Gareth and Spike were working with an unofficial lookout system in South Wales. Aidan had handed back a line blockage and for some reason or another, walked down the live side of a safety barrier uh, and the train arrived extremely soon after the, um, the line block was handed back. There were comments, whether they're true or not, I don't know, but there were comments made about it was the early days of social distancing. There were a number of trap workers working inside the safety fence and um, whether or not Aidan took a, a momentary slip lapse to go down the outside of the fence to provide himself with social distancing. But that, that literally, that split second decision, whatever caused it to go down the live side of a, an open railway fence um, had um, terrible consequences. And in February of this year, um, tragically, Tyler was struck and killed at Surbiton. Now we had made significant reductions um, in unassisted lookout working, which is one of our primary risks um, by the time Tyler was killed. So it was extremely, um, I guess, tragic, disappointing as well, that um, Tyler was struck and killed, again, proving the theory that unassisted lookout working is, or can be, lethally dangerous. There's a number of human factors that need, you know, that come into play, come in, in, into, into, into sharp focus when it comes to unassisted lookout working. And if they break down, um, something terrible can happen. So, it, you know, it just reminds us that, that you rarely get a second chance with a moving train and therefore our risk controls and our plan must make it absolutely um, prominent on how we separate track workers from trains. The two notices that were served in 2019, the, the one is that they were served as a pair and they require us to improve the way that we plan our work and provide sufficient safety equipment or technology. Um, I say safety equipment because I'm talking in the language um, that our track workers would understand. If I said technology, they might be kind of a little bit standoffish. Whereas if you say safety equipment, it means, it, I think it's a more friendly way of saying that we're here to provide you with the right equipment to do your job as safe as we possibly can. So the two notices that were served in 2019, they've got an expiry date or a compliance date of um, 2022 in July. And after they were served in, um, in July or August 2019, we've put in place a significant program of activities um, to understand much more about track worker safety risk and then manage the risk down so far as we reasonably can. Network rail is a big beast, I'm sure you all know that, and change doesn't happen um, organically, um, as you, as you well know. So there are 13 routes and we've appointed um, a direct and senior point of contact in every route in order to undertake um, this safety improvement programme. Each route then put in place a tangible plan. I was insistent on, um, on a consistent way of planning. So in terms of change management, safety change management, making sure that we've got well-described milestones, outcomes, the evidence that we require to complete a piece of work such that we can demonstrate that we're making progress at all times um, and, and, and we don't close a milestone until that evidence has been captured and uploaded into a, a document management system. We've got some leading safety measures, we've got some lagging safety indicators, all of which are being tracked all of the time. And you can see it in the top left hand side, um, we, we slipped marginally behind plan earlier this year some of that was due to Brexit. We were we were looking we were or sorry we were importing 
um, safety equipment, so warning equipment from Europe. And um, we, we had a little bit of delay there with the ports in January. But in the most part, our, our plan that we put together that was, um, that was put under formal change control in March 2020, we've more or less stuck to it. And we're about 98 to 99% on schedule um, as I sit here today. And we're, just, we're about 55 to 60% of the way through um, our safety improvement plan. So the key message there is that in a minute, I'll show you the progress that we've made, but the key message is that we haven't finished. We've got a lot more to do. We have a safety task force program board of um, significant stakeholders. There's a regional managing director, route director. There's also Mick Lynch, the general secretary of the um, RMT. Uh, Manuel is a member, although delegates that to the safety team in the TSSA. And we've also got um, um, RSSB colleagues and ORR colleagues, as well as um, some senior people in network rail in order to, to, to keep me, um, on the straight and narrow as it were, but also they're trusted advisors. They give me good advice on what to do with the programme. They hold me to account. And um, every four weeks that, that programme board has met ever since um, the you know, August, 2019. And I proceed, you know, I give them updates that some of which are numeric and some of which are obviously a little bit more um, qualitative in terms of the content. Every period we have a route director in, We've got 13 route directors, 13 periods. So we are on a continual cycle of um, senior stakeholder engagement and making sure that we hold every single route to account for delivering the changes that they've committed to do by this programme. So, so far, um, I mean, this conference is a year on since the last one. It seems like five minutes ago, the last one. It's two years since Gareth and Spike were killed, but um, some things that we've been up to, some of it pretty basic, some of it not so basic. Um, if I start on this little um, this little dial here, um, we updated um, our 019, our safety standard um, briefings, principles briefings, and we've briefed 98% of the people in network rail um, that hold PTS um, on the, the principles related to standard 019. That's about 25,000 people that we've briefed over the last 18 months. That did that was quite difficult during COVID because you um, face to face briefings were quite difficult. And um, but we've managed. We're nearly there now. The people that are left are people either on long term sick or don't need their PTS card. And if they um, those that haven't been briefed by March, their PTS card gets taken down automatically. We've deployed a, well nearly now a thousand track circuit operating devices to provide additional protection for planned line blockages. We've got a plan to get to about 1800, so we're just over halfway through that at the moment. But that provides additional protection for track workers working inside planned line blockages. We've developed, trialed, tested a brand new um, safe system of work pack planning system called RailHub. It integrates a number of network rail systems together and it provides a, a much more concise, simpler um, way to plan and a way to capture the pl planning information and then, and then provide that to people doing work on site. Um, it's all workflowed and for the person in charge, they can, um, they can hold their pack in, a, in, a, in an iPad. So it's an electronic safe system, a work pack. It will write to them from Sentinel. Also, um, a subsequent version, not the first version, it will have geolocating software so that you can only liven up your pack when you're at the right access gate. And it should um, reduce the planning cycle times by about 20%. Now, to some that, that's a, there's a degree of nervousness when I say we're gonna reduce planning cycle times by 20%. But what that really means is we're gonna increase the quality of our planning so people can check, evolve and learn lessons from plans and, and, and embed better practices inside their plans. The system itself gives much better management oversight in terms of how work is planned and delivered, the assurance that takes place as well. So it provides managers, it will provide managers with a much more vivid picture of how their work on their sections or their routes are, are being delivered. We are deploying train activated warning systems. So removing the um, or reducing the, the instance of human error. Um, we've got about 20 sites now live. We've got a, a significant program between now and the spring next year, where we bring into, into operation about 170 train activated warning sites. We've identified uh, and upgraded nearly 4,000 SafeSess walkways. SafeSess walkways are brilliant, in my opinion. 
you, you can walk separated from the trains. Um, they're not they're not hugely technical, um, and 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 they provide opportunities to keep work on day shift. They reduce signal workload because you don't need line blocks for walking, and um, you know, and they're separated from the trains. We're driving additional protection for line blockages, and um, it, that hasn't been our initial focus. Our initial focus has been the reduction in unassisted lookout working. Um, but the um, we take about 25,000 line blocks every four weeks, and um, we've increased the additional protection from 6% to about 32%. Now, we're going for a real push on this in 2022. And now that we have now virtually eliminated unassisted lookout working, which was our highest risk in terms of near miss um, causation, and also it, it is the most common cause of track worker fatalities by some margin over the last 15 years. Um, now that we are um, beyond December, we will be all but finished with um, Victorian lookouts. Um, in 2022, the, um, the, the, the stage has been set for really driving protection. But in any event, we've increased it from, we've undertaken signal workload assessments. We're conscious we don't want to transfer risk or assessment um, activity on all 680 signal workstations across the country. Unassisted lookout working has reduced by 97% um, now across the country. We were doing 32,000 hours every four weeks. We're now doing less than 1,000 hours a week. And we've got um, the remainder of that unassisted lookout working all but will diminish in December. So we're literally weeks away from, um, and there's some tangible things that will dr drive that. And that is converting visual inspections to automated inspections, roster changes, and more track access kicking in in December. And we've got a budget of 250 million pounds that we are we are upgrading uh, walkways, access points, investing in IT systems, and um, a lot more safety equipment, um, similar to this, the uh, the equipment and the and the and the um, actions that I've just highlighted on this slide. Have with me a second. So our primary focus has been unassisted lookout working. If you look at um, unassisted lookout working, it accounts for somewhere between 75 and 80% of all near misses in this control period. But when you look at how much work is done with unassisted lookouts, it's about 10%. So we have about 75 to 80% of our near misses um, on 10% of our work. So it's an obvious first place to look. And you'll see by the graph that we have systematically over a period of about 18 months um, wound down unassisted lookout working, or, or maybe more accurately, we wound, wound in safer forms of doing the work, whether that's automated, whether that's clustering and batching work more effectively in possessions, um, whether it's negotiating line blockage access. There's a number of different things that we've done in order to, um, to, 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 to reduce our dependency on, on, on lookouts. And like I said, we've got you know, hundreds more hours of lookout working per week reducing uh, from, um, from December when more actions that have been um, uh, scheduled kick in. We've been keeping an eye on near misses. So near misses, like I said, were happening approximately one and a half per week. We've also got other um, events that we measure called potential fatalities, which are when um, track workers, um, an event happens that on another day could have been a, you know, either a near miss or worse. Um, during the, the course of the safety task force, we've been tracking these measures. So you can see when the safety task force was formed, the blue measure shows you that for, for quite some time, the, um, um, the, the near miss incident frequency, were, or sorry, the, the, the total number of near misses um, stayed stubbornly high. Um, but since we've wound down unassisted lookout and allows working, so lookout operated warning system working as well, you can see we've gone from an a moving annual average of circa 60. In fact, it was, it was slightly above 60 um, historically. Um, we've, we're now down to, you know, in the region of about 20 per year. Um, and, and, and that has coincided with the reduction in lookout working. We've also normalized the near miss frequency rate by hours worked. So you can see here that blue line, which is the near miss incident frequency rate. You can see that coming down from a period, you know, from in, from 2019 onwards. But when you normalise that by hours worked, we've gone from um, originally some of it about 800 to 900,000 hours between near misses, and we're up over three million hours now between near misses. So it's it's a reason to be pleased 
but not a reason to be complacent at all. We're as good as our last good day and we are still having near misses. Last period, we had a couple of near misses that were very, very lucky that the track workers um, um, were able to get out of the way of trains. And, um, but it just reminds us that this work is not yet done. We're conscious of shifting risk elsewhere. Um, there's a number of places where we could potentially transfer risk. As a, for instance, we could um, increase the backlog of maintenance work, which ordinarily has good control measures in it, but that is a proxy for compliant infrastructure. So we've been really careful to, to make sure that we keep an eye on infrastructure compliance uh, with regard to maintenance and inspection activities. Also, signal workload. I mentioned earlier on that we've done a lot of work with signal workload. That work isn't done also. We've got a refreshed signal workload assessment tool from what we learned from the first one um, earlier, or late, the latter part of last year. And we, in early 2022, we relaunch um, an enhanced signal workload assessment tool. That will keep us, um, or enable us to make sure that we do not overburden um, signalers. There's a little bit of nervousness in the signaling locations that we're transferring this risk into signaling locations. It's not our intention, I must say, uh, but we've got to keep this in, in, in continuous check. And the other thing that we keep a, a really close eye on are irregularities. So if you look at operational close calls, and if you look at the risk weighting of operational close calls, when you normalize those by the level one investigations, um, you can see in the graph at the bottom of this sheet here, about a, just over a year ago, I was starting to get a bit worried because the, um, the operational close call risk went quite significantly up. But I'm really pleased to say that, that, has, that the scrutiny and the professionalism has shown that um, we can manage safety change without transferring it unduly elsewhere. Now, we're as good as our last good day on this. I'm not for one minute claiming an early victory here. But we, what we can show is that the risk weighted operational close call score is now at its lowest level in five years. But I still see risks. I still see um, events on the log where I think on that day we were lucky, on that night shift we were lucky. So we cannot in any way um, relent on this. We've got to keep an absolutely eagle eye on all forms of risk transfer, be it fatigue of track workers, be it signal workload, be it infrastructure compliance, be it third rail um, um, electrification systems if we're working at night. So there's so many different areas that we're looking at. And you, you, you know, it, it, it is a relentless focus in order to not transfer risk. The, um, the, 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 I mentioned about the signal workload assessments. There was very little or no data regarding line blockages. Now, line blockages in the future will be a, um, a key part of the plan in order to maintain the inspectile railway. That's inevitable. There's an inevitability in that. And one of the things I've learned in this process over the last two and a half years is anecdote is your enemy, data is your friend. And just to just kind of um, unpack that a bit, um, signalers quite often mention about the lack of professionalism in planning with regard to maintenance. Maintenance quite often um, say the signaler always says no when they apply for line blockages. And there was little data or no data to kind of understand what's going on in this space. So we now collect line blockage data from all 680 signal workstations and we get about an 85% to 90% return every four weeks. And what that told, tells us is that we take 10 times as many line blocks on midweek mornings than we do in the afternoons. But our roster, if you have a look at, if you have a look at the heat map, you can see the intensity, the, the, the deep red. And that's when we uh, put um, uh, increased volumes of line blockages in front of the signal workstations. If you look at the bottom graph on the right hand side, you can see we roster our staff on midweek mornings. And then we wonder why we are having uh, a lack of planning capacity on midweek mornings. If you then look at the operational closed calls, the potential fatalities and near misses, indeed the fatalities, they happen on midweek mornings. So there's got to be a maturity in planning whereby we do not peak signal workload, line blockage capacity or anything else on midweek mornings. And over time, we've been able to demonstrate um, a gradual shift in planning behavior where 
more line blockages are taken in the afternoon, some in the in the evening and into the night as well. And we're working to reduce that signaler workload in the mornings, but make sure we capitalize on line blockage um, availability, safer line blockage availability in the afternoons. We're also, I mentioned about additional protection. There is a nervousness that a signaler could inadvertently route a train into um, a line blockage. And we've been driving the increase on additional protection. The graph on the left hand side at the bottom shows by route um, the, 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 the kind of the, the, the rise from 6% up to up to the 32% I mentioned earlier. Some routes have made dramatic differences and it's coincided with a, with a reduction in operational close calls. So in early 2022, and now that we've reduced unassisted lookout working because that the, the effort involved in doing that has been significant, the focus for 2022 will be additional protection on planned line blockages and the deployment of more safety equipment to keep track workers safe. That slide, this slide here is just a, a, uh, an exploded or a larger version of the previous slide. So just going back to what I said about anecdote, at times signals are overworked. At times, signals do say no. Um, at times, maintenance could plan better. And, and, that, and now what we've been able to do is very vividly see how we can all get on better in terms of creating a plan that's, that doesn't um, overly um, risk the signalers and also um, um, means that we can coherently roster staff with which to do work at safer times of the day when signal workload has not been peaked. And the only way that we've managed to untangle this is data. Uh, data is your friend, anecdote is your enemy. I won't dwell on this slide too much. The company um, has committed a significant financial amount to, to improving track worker safety. There's all manner of different um, investments here, safe cess walkways, access points, safety equipment, technology, uh, and, and many, many other things that are all targeted to reduce the risk to, to track workers without, and um, obviously to iterate, in doing that in such a way that we don't unduly um, shift the risk elsewhere. Um, like you can, you can see at the moment, um, we, we're, we're at year three, the spend goes up next year. So we've got more to do next year and then it tails down in year five. So we've got a sizable sum of money still to spend. And we've got uh, a lot of um, tangible interventions planned over the next 12 to 24 months in order to sustain the reduction in lookout working that I've described so far. A summary, slightly out of date this slide. Um, we have reviewed 28, so we have 28 million different tasks to maintain our railway. We are now 93% of the way through the second pass of um, that review. We've been able to modernize some tasks. We've been able to apply some risk-based frequency to some tasks. We've been able to remove some tasks. We've been able to batch some tasks. And, and we've been able to, 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 um, to modernize the way that we plan the work to make it much more effective when you consider the safety risk of access, accessing the railway infrastructure. We've done this um, in parallel with a 97% reduction in our highest risk uh, warning type, which is unassisted lookout working. I mentioned about the CES walkways. We're nowhere near done with that yet. We've got a lot more to do with regard to providing safe and separated walkways. And a lot of the investment over next year will, um, will improve um, line side assets. We continue to work with signalers, line blockages, um, special signal box instructions and, and line blockage registers to make sure that we create a line blockage plan that is sustainable, well thought through, additionally protected and doesn't um, shift risk to signalers. There's still more to do there. We've improved line blockage data. We continue to do that. We've um, negotiated additional possessions um, and many of those were non-disruptive. So we've been able to take advantage of quieter times in the railway. We, um, we also reduced near misses the, the frequency of near misses in terms of between hours worked has raised from nearly 800,000 to 3.1 million hours between near misses. And the, the moving annual average has reduced from, from circa 70 down to, to, to 19. So there's, um, there's, there's quite a lot to be cheerful, but absolutely none and no place to be complacent here. We've still got plenty to do. And certainly I've been in touch with a number of routes and regions over the last couple of weeks, been there personally, made visits and had conversations myself. There's still a lot to do to sustainably um, to embed this. Um, what we've seen is, an, for want of a better word, an elastic deformation. Unless we carry on and complete the task, it will 
um, degrade and deform back to where we were. So it's really important that we finish the job. So just a, a kind of summary. I talked about um, replacing anecdotes. I've heard, I don't know how many anecdotes I've heard on the railway, quite a few, and I dare say there'll be a few more for me before I retire. But the, the reality is data is your friend. I mean, something, something as simple as um, knowing the near miss frequencies with the different types of protection and warning. Lows, look out operated warning system. You have a near miss every 30,000 hours. Stubbornly um, consistent. Look out every 50,000 hours, a near miss. Whereas if you look at um, line blockages, unprotected line blockages, the, um, the, the near miss uh, frequency is, is, you know, you're about 30 times safer, even in an unprotected line blockages. You're about 200 times safer in a T3 possession. So using those as kind of filters with which to prioritize how you, how you so far as you reasonably can keep track workers safe has been quite important that we educate people on the risks that they're taking rather than the anecdotes that they, on the belief systems that they have. We've engaged a lot with our front line. Um, th there's still much more to do here, um, although they've seen a dramatic change. And those that have made zero lookout working, I've seen, you know, um, I've certainly heard personal uh, feedback that they wish they'd done it earlier, but there are some that are in difficult situations at the moment with complex um, kind of halfway stages in their plans. And it's really important that we finish the job off for them. We've driven accountability at root sorry, that regional route delivery unit, operational manager and section manager level. So we've got data broken down right to the very front and, um, and that obviously helps in terms of driving accountability and personal responsibility being taken. We're sorting some basics, access points and walkways. We've got a lot to do there, but we are making progress in that area. And we are investing in novel technology. So we've got three and a half thousand miles more remote inspections of plain line track assets. Um, two years on. We are experimenting with a trial switch and crossing management system uh, with um, Caroline, who, who kindly introduced me. The team that Caroline did have converted um, rail vehicles to, to, um, to, to, to deliver remote geometry and high definition CCTV inspections for some of our high risk assets. And we, we're experimenting with drones, geofencing equipment and much, much more. And this, this program has driven the, the burning platform to modernize the way that we, um, that, we, that, we, that, we, that we maintain and inspect our railway. So for the next six months, more to do. Beyond six months, plenty more to do. So a real, a real hard push now between now and the end of December to remove the remaining unassisted lookout working. And then between now and March, end of March 2022, to remove lookout operative warning systems. Like I mentioned before, we can't do too much concurrently because the risk of transfer is significant. So now that we have removed or reduced lookout working so far, a real focus now on additional protection in 2022 is the order of the day. And we've already put in a lot of groundwork here um, with regard to employing uh, signal box technicians to do remote disconnections, deploying TCODs, track circuit operating devices that have not yet been commissioned, but they're nearly ready. And we've got more to do in 2022. Ensuring that walking activities are, are clearly um, risk assessed and managed. We've, um, we've, we've, we've done a lot of work in this area since, um, since August of this year. And we can, now, um, we can now clearly demonstrate with data that um, over 95% of our walking is done safely. But there's, there's, that means that 5% of it we don't know. And we're using um, pattern recognition uh, video imagery to make sure that we understand on that remaining 5%, what risks are we taking and what more can we do to make sure that the walk from the access point to the asset is safe. In December this year, we get some possessions um, that have been adjusted. They become live in the timetable change in early December. There's more to do in this regard. We've negotiated further access for next year, and we've done that in a collaborative way with our train operators, which is, um, I'm, and I'm grateful to the train operators for understanding um, the, the, the situation that we are in as a company, but we've been also able to demonstrate we've put a lot of homework into our plan. We've modernised the way that we plan and we've done a lot of things to help ourselves before we've gone to ask for help. And then ultimately, at the end of 2022, routes and regions have got to do this for themselves and perpetually. So we're coaching and putting in place business as usual um, um, transfer arrangements to make sure that the work that we've done in the last two years perpetuates and carries on. 
and that's uh, making sure that we um, we put in place the measurement systems, the management um, arrangements, and and the various things that we need to do to make sure that um, everyone can 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 perpetually um, see and manage what they need to do in order to keep track workers safe. And that's it. That's the enemy presentation. A couple of minutes over, I think maybe, or maybe just in front of the um, the time for questions. I'm not sure, but there or thereabouts. Um, I quite often post on LinkedIn. I post little blogs, videos of where I am and what I'm doing, updates, um, and posts on the task force. If you'd like to, um, if you'd like to follow them, if that's of interest to you, please do. Um, just type in Nick Millington, and um, I, I do that possibly once a week with um, with short, maybe five minute updates every week. And if uh, if you'd like to do that, then I'll, obviously that's uh, that's a choice for you. But um, that's me now done. I was going to hand over back to to Caroline for questions. So thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. That was a great presentation and, um, you know, really great work that's been done by all of you and also specifically the safety task force. So well done. And, you know, that's really enlightened me with regards to everything that's going on, the, the real big picture and the interconnectivity of everything that affects our track worker safety. Um, I've got one question from this morning um, that actually came from another, another um, webinar, if that's OK. And then I'll hand over to Keith um, for some live questions. One of them was, um, how do we get more access to maintain rail, the railway without reducing the number of trains or working at night? Um, let me just repeat that. So how do we get more access to the railway? Yep. Without reducing trains or working at night? Um, I think we've got to be smart. So if you look at the access that we've got and the resources that we already have already got working on night shifts we don't or we previously didn't um, efficiently plan and batch tasks so i mentioned earlier that we're almost the second pass through the 28 million tasks effectively clustering and batching tasks which means that the existing people that are on nights um, they might be a bit busier uh, but it means that we are doing the work in in a safer way um, so there, there is a there is a, an opportunity that we've realised there. And looking at Eastern Region that are four years into work bank reviews and refinement, um, there's more to do here in terms of iteratively improving the plan. I showed the power of data, uh, signal workload and line blockages in the afternoon. Um, obvious opportunity there to, yeah. to, to make sure that, um, that, 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 we, you know, that we use that resource more effectively which might mean that we've got a roster afternoons more than we have done previously. Since I've been on the railway, um, typically, unless you're on a fault roster, um, you're out the gate by about three o'clock in the afternoon. And obviously that means a site time of, of before that. So I think we've all got to act in a mature way. It's not a, it's not a binary, you're all going on nights. Well, I do hear those sort of anecdotes. It, there's a, a combination of things. Also, um, there is a, a kind of, a perpetual narrative that you need to put a human there. So do we always need to put a human there? If you look at, as a for instance, the SNC inspection trains that were released from Derby um, five or six weeks ago, can a section manager do a proportion of those inspections to, or sat behind their desk? And the answer is yes, not all, but some. Plain line pattern recognition, we switched that on, so we don't need to. So previously where we are using line blocks, we're putting people in, or, or, or indeed lookouts, we are using other ways to do that work. If you look at um, high level inspections, OHLE and things like that, drones, it's not, it's not, it, it won't do everything, but it will reduce the amount of time that we need to put a human there and then we can put the human in the line block. So I think there's ways of working smart before we start um, reverting to um, um, more night work. The final thing I'd say is that there are the, in, dial, in the dialogue we've had with train operators, there are a number of possessions that when you actually look at the length of them, they can be marginally extended without creating uh, too much of an issue for the service. And if we are, um, you know, if, if, if it's mutually acceptable to, that we can, we can ease possessions rather than, so, sorry, slightly lengthen them without impacting the way that we maintain rolling stock and position rolling stock and staff and all that sort of stuff. Then there are some times where there was white space in possessions or between possessions and when we actually carry um, 
not fair paying passengers because an empty coaching stock is obviously an important thing or so is freight. But there, there have been opportunities to optimise possession durations as well. And that's the sort of thing that we've all got to kind of really seek in order to not work with a lookout flag. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Keith, over to you. Thank you. Thanks again, Nick. Uh, yeah, there's a few very good points, a few very good questions. I'll take them in no real particular order. William Peaks made, made a very a uh, couple of good points. I thank you uh, in terms of the work being completed. And also a couple of questions, William, which are very good. There's one there about not avoiding an increase in maintenance backlog, which looks at the question in being, how do we become more efficient in possession working as an access for everyone? Uh, mentioning use of access in particular, how do we use wraps better? You know, is there anything going on to improve access in general for possession work? So, I think what I've heard there's two questions. One is about backlog, yes. and then the other is about physical access to the railway, isn't it? Yeah. So, backlog, when you, what I've observed over the last uh, two years, there have been different ways to come at this, and each route has chosen a different way. So, as a for instance, Wales route took a, a very measured 18 month reduction to, and they have actually eliminated lookouts. They've actually taken down their competence as well, by the way, in Wales, certainly in the Cardiff delivery unit. But they did it in such a way that didn't um, drive backlog up. There are other routes that would take a calculated risk in driving backlog up, but not losing sight of compliance. So Western, my old route, for instance, they drove backlog up, but kept an eagle eye on compliance, but knowing full well that they had a backlog recovery plan that kicked in. It was a purposeful increase in backlog to, to bring it back down again afterwards once rosters, access and things had kicked in. There have been some routes where the reduction in lookout working I think has been more emotional, certainly after Tyler was struck and killed. And we, that's the bit where if you've got um, high backlog in the first instance, then you've got to keep a really, really close watch on compliance and also have a really good idea of how you're going to get backlog back. Um, and, the, and that's when I, when I talked about sustaining this situation, that's what I'm referring to now. So the, it's in those routes. I mean, I would say that there are probably half of the routes that, or maybe more than that, probably three quarters uh, or two thirds perhaps that have gone through that um, that phase of lookout reductions and have sustained the backlog. We've got about a third of the routes that are of just starting that phase now. So sustainably keeping or ret returning backlog to where it needs to be. Infrastructure compliance looks reasonable, but if we've got any non-compliant infrastructure, it's always a risk and we have. So it's in a much better place than it was, but there's more to do and there's always more to do. So I'm never gonna say we're done. So that hopefully that it's it's a, it's all about planning. I'm afraid, um, which yeah, is absolutely. Which it does it ties into I think William's second question there about possession access. Yeah. And absolutely coming from the the IP world, uh, the, the contracting world, you know, late notice uh, and planning of possessions has become, as William says here, very much uh, more robust over the last few years. So William suggests that we become more fluid more accepting to lower risk access into possession, presumably for maintenance volume there, to undertake surveys, reactive works, where we can manage that within possession work. So I don't know, his question is, is any work going on to improve that or engage with the IP contracting world to allow more access into possessions for, to allow maintenance work to happen at night? Um, there will be some possessions and line blocks that will be kind of golden type compliance type maintenance blocks and it's really important if we don't if we don't deliver the maintenance you haven't got a railway simply put I mean, yeah. I was put in that situation as a maintainer when Great Western Electrification was being built over my head and there were a number of times where I had to put my card down and say look if you don't let me in you ain't gonna have a railway because I'm not going to open it unsafe so um, I think being much more clear on which um, which what, what access is critical versus what is desirable, I think is really important. If um, I would also, I think with, if you look at the, um, the, the planning standard, I'm not advocating wholesale late notice change. I'm not saying that that's the right thing to do, but there's sometimes there is good change and there is bad change. And I think one of the things that we perhaps should look at is how do we, so at the moment, if I want to ease something as a maintainer, or someone wants to ease something for me as a maintainer, and we've already had a discussion about how do we integrate that work, and we've done that and it's safe, I get a KPI put against me that it's a bad change. It's not a bad change. It's, it's taking advantage of a safe situation. 
And I think we really need to look at whether or, you know, how do we manage safe change, not, um, uh, not unsafe change? Yeah. It's, certainly, I'm not advocating wholesale, like chaos at the last minute. I wouldn't want that. But that I think we can be, I think we need to somehow reflect that in some instances, we're good at managing change, but not yeah. take advantage of it. I mean, Ed, not Ed, uh, Nick, will this even prompt a better dialogue and a better communication and coordination between network rail maintenance and the contracting world? It'll have you know, to. We there's have no, to. No we way. have to. Yeah, there's no have to work, uh, you know, yeah. I've done some CDM work today. Coordination and cooperation and communication is, is key to it's all there. that as well as this. So sorry, I'll go into another couple of questions. Well, sorry, the, what about the um the access point question? I, yes, I sorry, there was a, a question there that, that William Peake also raised about uh, he's having more and more challenges in the use of RAP access. He's got neighbour issues with RAPs. And I'm presuming, having done this myself, availability of RAPs as well. Yeah. Well, if there's any work to improve general access points. So certainly access points, we're putting in more in general i'd say pedestrian access points um which which will help i'm not saying that you know that'll get your road rail vehicles and obviously because it won't but we're, we're putting in a number of new access points right across the country scotland when i was up there not that long ago i'd done i think i'm right in saying they're 47 in and 47 more planned for instance over and above what they've already got um and east coast western and a number of other routes I've, you know the, the plenty of plenty of activity there sussex as well actually um, where I've seen, and that's not to say that the others aren't, it's just I can't remember, they're the ones that I've seen recently, where, where we can see, you know, improved physical access points. Um, with regard to road rail vehicle access points, there's never enough, and certainly if you're delivering works. You know, one of the things that worries me, another, another piece of work that I look after is on-track plant safety. And if you look at, when you, when you drill the data on on-track plant events, a disproportionate amount of on-track plant safety events happen in the transit. Then you look at where the transits come from and go into, you think, I wonder if we can do better than that in terms of distance. And I won't necessarily um, take the time now, but there, there will always be a need for um, the decent access for machinery and people. I think if, you, if you're in a kind of project space, you've got an ideal opportunity as a part of the project to leave a legacy. Um, so as a part of the specification for a project, you kind of build your way in and leave it there for, forevermore. Um, but there's always, there's always more to do. Yeah, there's a couple of questions. I think on a, on a similar theme, one from Chris Ibbotson and one from Debbie Heard uh, about asking how you engage further with operators to increase maintainer access. That's in relation to work at Sheffield from Chris. And Debbie's got a question about, uh, as a subcontractor, how can we collaborate better with maintenance as we'll all be trying to access the same line blocks? And I presume the same goes for possessions. So, Okay, uh, so it, yeah. I've the first one was operators, the second one was line blocks. So if I deal with operators... So we've had good engagement with the engineer access statement for 2022, uh, which kicks in in a couple of weeks time. And we've been negotiating with operators for over a year now uh, on the on the possession plan that starts. Um, and that, that's for um, to, to, to improve the access for maintenance inspection type activities. So that's a that's a kind of first cut, first pass thing. Then secondly, um, the Department of Transport has put collaboration clauses in the top passenger contracts that kick in from April. And it requires collaboration and specifically collaboration on track worker safety. So it, I don't think it would have been right for us as an industry to go to the train operators a couple of years ago and say, just give us the access, please. And I'd say, have you reviewed your work? Have you done this? Have you modernized? Have you batched? Have you done? And we, to be honest with you, I wouldn't have looked them in the eye. I, wouldn't, I couldn't have done it because it isn't right. We make our money. And, and, and provide a service moving people and, and freight. And it wouldn't be right for us as engineers, work deliverers, to, 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 to bite the hand that feeds us in, in my take. But now we've done a lot of work in this regard. Um, the DFT can see that, and they put these collaboration clauses in the, in, the, in, the, in the passenger train contracts. But that's not all contracts because obviously freight and open access are there as well. And the other thing that we are, debating at the moment is a national network change that, that basically announces that um, um, the situation with the notices and, and um, it requires further um, safety collaboration when it uh, comes to securing the right access to maintain our railway. And that's, I've got a meeting on that on the 25th of November to, to, to further consider, but we are not going back to flags yeah. and therefore we can only go forward. There's no way back. And we've got to put in place, place 
sustainable measures. I mean, I maintain the Western route and I used to have to fault the railway at airport junction to maintain it. That's not right. You wouldn't do it with a jumbo jet and you shouldn't do it with the railway. And therefore, we've got to be mature about this industry level maturity to make sure that we've got enough safe access to do the things that we need to do to keep the railway safe. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of questions, I think, hopefully, which there may There was a second finish. one there, line blocks. Sorry, there was, yeah. So, Apologies. So just very maybe. quickly on that one. Yeah. On line blocks, um, we, on the 25th of November, we conclude, <laughs> hopefully conclude, that is, for trade union colleagues that might be on the call, um, the, the consultation of Rail Hub, the new planning system. In Rail Hub is the line blockage planning tool, which is open to all people, Network Rail and, um, and, our, and our supply chain. And that is a, for want of a better word, I was going to say EasyJet way of booking a seat, but I, I don't know if that's a good analogy or not. But basically, there's a, there's a, there'll be a register, online register of where you can reserve your line blocks. And if someone's in it, it'll have their phone number and you can go and talk about co-location with them or you can talk about negotiating a trade with them. But more importantly as well, if people don't turn up for those line blockages, we get good management insight and we can have a coaching conversation as to why they didn't turn up. And we can improve. Yeah. making sure that we don't overbook, that we do co-locate, that we've got enough protection controllers and, we, and we, we're transparent in the way that we um, provide access to the railway. So that's, that's, I think that answers that question. Absolutely. Yeah, and I get a couple of points made here that I'm going to roll together a little bit. John Richardson and Godfrey Carey, who I both know. There's no fix here at all, gents. Uh, John's <laughs> thanks is for the sharing the information and he's asking if there's a platform where, you know, we can drill into this a bit more detail, you know, get some material in, in terms of what the, the stats are currently and what the future aims and goals are of the task force. And Godfrey's asking as well about plans for, you know, more direct briefings of supply chain staff. And I suppose that's a comment from me in terms of, the, the, you know, the safety changes and the investment are, are, are huge. So, you know, how are we going to publicise this and, you know, yeah. keep driving this forward? I think that's a good question, John, in terms of what, is it a platform? Is it a website? Do you know. So, what I've done is, um, I have spent time going by ISLG and via RECA, the Rail Industry Association, the Track Safety Alliance. Where I know, I know some. Not everyone. Will, the cascade may not flow. If you know what I mean, I get that. But I'm always happy to do more. And I've got people um, outstationed, as it were, right around the country. So, if um, if if you'd like more or you'd like me to come and speak then i'm always up for that and, and there's others in my team as well it's not just me yeah. um so, so i've also briefed the capital delivery directors i go to their meeting once every four weeks there's i've, I've made every effort to try and, and and provide the cascade points but i recognize that doesn't always flow so if, if there's more i can do and if somebody would like to kind of drop me a message on linkedin if i can help that way or drop me an email or whatever it might be i'll do my best to get to 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 to, to, to link that all up yeah, I, just quite a lot, I was with the Trans Pennine team the other day. You know, they, they seem to, to reach out for me quite a lot. So they get yeah, because there there's a but... wide, uh, there's a quite a wide team that you have, Nick, in terms of you know different routes, different regions have got members of the safety task force. There are potentially people we could engage with as well. Every route, every region. Yep. Yep. Directly employed in the route and in the region as well. So they're available. Um, we've got about two hundred people on the ground. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's about it in terms of questions. Apologies if I missed anyone, but I think there was, a, there was one question earlier on that I, I can't see what look at. I think was answered because it was asked about you know 20 minutes in. So okay. hopefully that's everything yeah. just now, Nick. Thank you. Nick, can, right. I, can I just um, quickly say, uh, a year ago when you came on, we literally had the Margam report out a week before, and it was quite a lot of pressure and quite a lot of um, questions put onto you at that time. Yeah. But I would just personally like to say, you know, congratulations on that work done and that achievement is absolutely incredible. To have that volume, uh, you know, presented today, a year on, is really commendable to you and your team. So uh, thank you very much. And I'll hand you just back to... I think um, it's a tribute to, to everyone in the rail industry. I can't take the credit for it. There are some people, and many, I mean, I can think of now, that have personally challenged themselves, their own work-life balances and all sorts of things in order to do this. So it's not its not me. Well, maybe it is a bit of me, but you know, credit should go in, in far and wide. Okay, thanks, Nick. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And especially to Nick for presenting today. 
Um, it's been good collaborative progress on near miss reductions in the railways and like you said it's it's been a joint effort but certainly wouldn't have happened um, in any time um, soon if it hadn't been for yourself Nick and, and your team so thank you very much there. And just to sort of um, recap as well, that data is your friend. So um, everybody, yeah, we, we need to, yeah, we need to be collecting collecting that data and making sure that we are all continuing to head in the right direction. And and I know that better planning and a multitude of other technology data and process um, improvements are all key to that. So thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, Keith, and um, thank you everyone for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.